Well, hello, uh, Monsignor Pope. How are you? This is uh, Simone here with Endow. And hello, Endow ladies who are tuning in or watching. I'm very happy to spend this this time in the morning. It's, it's the morning here in California where I am. But Monsignor, you're in Washington, D.C. So um, so happy to talk to you this morning. And um, the reason why I invited you um, to be a part of this interview is because I read your um, your article on, a, you know, a priestly testimony for kind of the turbulent times we're living in. And I thought it was one of the, the best things that I read out there mm. uh, in, in the uh, social media world and uh, mm -hmm. online writing world. And uh, for those who don't know Monsignor Charles Pope, you should definitely know him because he is a fantastic pastor at St. Cyprian's in Washington, D.C. and also a, a blogger, a speaker. He has the gift of gab. And if there's anybody that I want to listen to, uh, it's certainly he is uh, one of my top choices. And um, when I was a high school teacher, I often followed his writings and used some of his articles with my high school students to kind of spark conversations, particularly in the realm of, of moral theology. So that was... Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the articles that I, I most remember sparking a lot of great conversation was the article you wrote, Father, on can atheists be moral? How can they mm -hmm. what we know? And I love that. And it, it, it sparked great conversation in my high school senior moral theology class. So, mm -hmm. so Father, please, um, thank you for writing that priestly, priestly testimony. And uh, I, if there's anything you'd like to say about that now, I mean, I, I kind of want to leave this conversation open-ended and just see, see where we go. So yeah. there's so much I could talk to you about. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I wrote that testimony. Uh, it's in the National Catholic Register. I think if you go to the commentary section or just search on my name, you can I'll, find I'll it. Link, I'll link it to this video and this podcast so everybody will have the link. Good. Yeah. yeah. You know, for me, as I say, as a priest, I, 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 I know lots of people from all different backgrounds and um, different political points of view. You, when you're a priest, you know, everybody knows you. <laughs> and uh, you try to get to know them too. And I think that, you know, I've been largely in my priesthood a, a pastor in Af largely African-American parishes. So um, that that's given me, a, you know, an understanding of the issue of racism and how personally it's experienced. You know, I think there's a lot of people who just sort of doubt the experience or say, well, we used to be that way, but we're so much better and, and so on. And uh, yes, I think we have made a lot of progress. You know, segregation is no longer legal. We, 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 you know, we don't have these separate but equal, so-called equal schools and, you know, all that. Yes. So we've made, I think, a lot of progress. But I, you know, these are men and women I trust. I've, I've almost grown up with them. I mean, I've been 31 years a priest and most of those 31 years have been in largely African-American parishes. And um you know, they over the years shared with me their experiences of trying to hail a cab while black, or mm -hmm. how they feel like they're they're not tr treated equally by the police, or or what have you. And you know, I, every now and again, I hear people say, "Well, let's look at the statistics." But what what they're saying is, "No, I, this is our experience." And it, it, you know, I just I just learned to trust and accept that that's that's an experience that they yeah. that they've had, and it causes a lot of grief. Right. And so I would just say to everybody, you know, who maybe doesn't it doesn't seem immediately obvious to them to at least be willing to listen to the experience of other people. But on the other hand, I also, especially in this, in this whole thing that surrounded with, you know, the death of uh, our brother, George Floyd, you know, there, there, there's a lot of other grief expressed too. Um, for example, we were told that we absolutely had to follow all these norms uh, for COVID. Uh, we had to wear masks and keep socially distant and st stay in home, stay at home orders and things, only essential things. And, Suddenly, when all these protests erupted, all the rules went away. And, you know, people kind of scratch their head and they say, this seems so duplicitous. You know, um, we can't, it's so dangerous that our churches have to be closed. For us, we cannot gather for worship, even outdoors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so dangerous. But then people can, can protest about a kind of a popular issue and all the all the rules go away, and and in fact, even you know people are saluting these protesters, and and so and that caused real grief, and it's really for the same thing, isn't it? It's just for from a different angle, it's about disparity, it's it's about you know un unfairness. Mm -hmm. uh, w what we do in church is so dangerous, but what they do out here, um, including rioting and burning, not 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 the uh, peaceful protests, but you get the idea. I mean, well, all this is to be overlooked, and that, 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 that causes people real grief. Or when Archbishop Gregory, my own Archbishop, and I, I, I love him to death, he's been very, very good to me and to all of us priests. 
But I mean, he, he got, I think, in a moment of anger, you know, he said some very strong words about the president's visit, which um, how many traditional Catholics and just, you know, regular Catholics do I know that are waiting for him or any bishop to use language like that? that is unacceptable, that's completely contrary to our Catholic values, when, say, a Nancy Pelosi is invited to Georgetown to receive honors, or frankly just stands in the pulpit of the cathedral to give a eulogy. Uh, where, where is the outrage? Where is the... Uh, the uh, so, again, the sense of sort of duplicity, you know, and um, mm -hmm. I could go on, but I mean, what I, say, what I guess what I'm trying to say is that I hold a lot of people in my heart from, who have very different perspectives, but share something in common, which is grief and anger. Yeah. In a sense that things are not fair, that there's a lot of duplicity, yeah. hypocrisy, um, a lot of lip service, and uh, it, it causes grief. And so I think I was trying to articulate that grief and to uh, ask all of us to maybe listen to each other a little more. Yeah. That there's real, there's real grief on all sides. And let's, yeah. let's at least honor that and not just say, well, your grief doesn't matter. I felt it was very pastoral. I felt like your article, and I really hope everybody listening um, and watching reads it because it felt like from, it felt like very pastoral. I felt cared for as, as, as a spiritual sheep all the way across the country um, that you you were taking seriously every single perspective and angle that you could. And that, that was meaningful for me because for many of us who've lived these past months, we feel kind of lost and we don't mm -hmm. know how we, we need help making the proper judgments about what's going on in the, in the public square and so forth. So it was very, very helpful. And I think what I really love about what you were saying too just now is that we need to listen to each other because the truth is the statistics and like all of America is not my problem, but my community, my church, my, you know, just operating on the principle of subsidiarity and solidarity uh, to listen to the experiences of those who are directly in my circle and in my life and, and being, uh, accompanying them, whichever angle they might be from, whichever, you know, and I have friends from all, you know, diverse backgrounds and whatnot and politically diverse as well to be a, a true friend and Christ to them, I think that to me, that was the, the real, the real sphere of influence I have is very small and let me, let me accompany them well and not right. worry about all the statistics out there. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so father, thank you for, for, for writing that. Um, so what do you want to talk about? We, you know, we both have the gift of gab. <laughs> so, but I, well, I'm, 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 your I'm excited gap. about uh, what you're doing with Endow. I mean, you know, I, I, I think that, the life of the mind, um, the fact that I know that among the topics you cover are, you know, uh, is, um, uh, you know, philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think what a lot of people don't know, well, they, don't, they may know, but they don't know how, but we're in the mess we're in today for reasons. Um, there's been a shift uh, in, in sort of the locus of truth. Over the over the centuries, it goes way re really back. I would say, if you know, if I were to trace it, one of the one of the books I, I would recommend to people to read it. It's a little heavy, but it's uh, the Passage to Modernity uh, by a guy named Dupre. But he traces the mess that we're in today all the way back to at the High Middle Ages. You know, the the great medieval synthesis when uh, Saint, Saint Saint Thomas Aquinas was writing and everything. There was a lot of things that really came together in kind of what we call Christendom. There, there was a pretty common outlook and there was a kind of a cross-pollination between uh, the church, the scriptures, the, uh, the state, uh, laws and customs, culture. All these things were sort of tightly woven into what we call Christendom. And it, it produced a very fair flower. You know, people hear Middle Ages, they just think Dark Ages. You know, th those were the very early Middle Ages. But by the 13th century, there was a great blossoming of learning, of truth. We, the universities came alive. Uh, we began, you know, the sciences, the physical and other sciences became uh, much more sophisticated in their methodologies. And it, it was a great blossoming of the intellectual life. And then the first chip in the, the first chip in it really was, you know, the rise of nominalism. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you had uh, Occam and others like that who began, they asked, I think, a legitimate question. I don't want to get too heavy, but they asked a legitimate question. Um, are universals uh, just some, a construct of the mind or are they really out there to be discovered? So there's um, trees and then there's treeness and those are universals. Treeness is a universal. Uh, or humanness, or I don't know, chairness. I mean, that's kind of silly, yeah. but you get the idea. Yeah. Certain things, you, they called them universals. And late, largely, they, the nominalists concluded that these were just sort of categories that we constructed uh, in our own mind for, for our own sake. And I don't, I don't entirely say that was an utterly illegitimate answer, but it was the first step back from right. a reality-based 
uh, locus of truth to a mind base. Yeah. So, and from down, it went downhill from there. You know, uh, of course, Descartes, you know, because I, all I know is that I'm doubting. And, uh, you know, cogito ergo sum, but that's it. That's about all I can say. I don't even, I don't know if you exist. I don't know if all this technology is true. I might be dreaming, you know, and that radical doubt. Um, and it's, it's been, you know, downhill from there. I don't want to trace it all for, you know, Locke, Hume, you know, and of course, ultimately to Nietzsche, who said, really, there's nothing, there's nothing out there. There's, I mean, it's in the sense of that. There is no meaning. Right. It's just nothing right. has meaning. And so he died in an insane asylum. He's the only one, by the way, who ever really had the courage to live. I'm going to courage in quotes. But I ever had really had the courage to live. That there's absolutely no meaning to anything. Yeah. You know, ironically, if, if Nietzsche's family <laughs> took him seriously, they would have uh, left him to fend for himself. But they, mm -hmm. his, his sister cared for him at the end of his life. Mm -hmm. But, um, you but know, anyway, I guess maybe just to say that, yeah. if I wanted to, to round it out, that over the centuries, what we've been doing is increasingly stepping back from reality and living up in our head. Yep. And so that the locus of truth moves from the object to the subject. Yes. Yeah. And so that's where we get subjectivism and relativism is a form of that. Um, we're like, man, that's true for you, man. Uh, well, <laughs> you've, you've utterly corrupted the notion of truth if you say that. Yes. Because truth is, is what it is. And, and we discover it is not something we make. Um, yes. But of course, existentialism and others argue that no, there's, nothing, there's no real meaning out there except what we put there. Yeah. And again, what we've done is we've, we've, we're living up in our head. And that's why if you, if you were to ask, say, a, a, you know, a, a person of homosexual orientation, have you noticed that the, the parts don't like fit? And it, it, well, what's that got to do with it, man? It's not about my body. It's just about how I feel. It's what I think. Or yeah. and now there's transgenderism where it's very obvious whether a person is male or female. Just a quick look down there. I'm, you know, yeah. say it. <laughs> we'll solve the problem. But it's like, well, but the, what does my body matter? It's how I feel, what I think. So we're living up here. And yeah. we step back from reality. And I think that would be my quick tour of how we're in the mess that we're in today. Yeah, and it is fascinating to watch the progression of like intellectual history and thought that kind of led to this. It's a, it's a, it, the, the slippery slope is actually quite logical because if you start with doubting the universal shared human nature and you start with doubting the universals and, and abstract being able to abstract, which is like the very meaning of humanity is that I, I can make abstractions. Um, then, mm -hmm. then yeah, we are at this point of uh, kind of absurdity and really even being able to see like the simple truth of reality is gone and you'll maybe laugh or cry at this story but my sister was a college, uh, college counselor for a while and she called in a student who had been delayed in writing his college essays and she said okay um you know where are your essays you got to apply for school and he said well i'm not sure that i even exist so before i can write an essay and he was serious he wasn't being you know we thought maybe being a little punk but i'm not sure i exist so until I'm certain that I am real and exist, I, I can't proceed with my future. I mean, talk about being stuck in your head. I mean, you mentioned, you know, the, the trans movement and all that, and that's a whole other thing. But I mean, these, these are, and then we wonder why there's like this epidemic of loneliness and, and the opioids and, you know, particularly Americans uh, take more antidepressants and anxiety medication than the or other world to come. I mean, mm -hmm. statistics are through the roof. And again, not to not to say that those you know those aren't legitimate medications and people need them, but there's this like there has to be this connection and this disparity. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I would also say it's one of the reasons why we're so loud and angry in our culture today, because you know if if we don't have a kind of a common way we can argue, a, a common reality to which we all refer. Or uh, the other aspect of our problem today is that we, we were, we're engaged in a foolish experiment to see if we can have a culture without a shared cultus. Yes. Um, cultus, of course, you know, cult, as you know, comes off poorly in English, but it means a devotion or an understanding yes. of God, someone or something higher than us to which all of us look and say, well, I got to obey that. When you don't have a shared cultus anymore, and when you don't even have a sense that uh, there's a reality even outside of my head, or that there's a meaning out there to be discovered, um, what you end up with is who, how can you even have a debate? How can you even have an argument, good argument, I mean by that, or um, a reasoned discourse uh, when you can't even find out which bathroom you're supposed to go to? I mean, that is very, very fundamentally problematic. And so what ends up happening is that who wins the argument? Not the one who appeals to the reasonableness, but the one who yells the loudest, who has yeah, the most violence. power, who has the most money, uh, yeah, and the violence or the most exotic. And that's what Benedict called the tyranny of relativism. You know, when yeah. you shift from the object to the subject and everything becomes relative, 
The only way you win is by yelling and screaming and imposing uh, your meaning on somebody else. And, and emotion, uh, I mean, I, I read a few years back this uh, Orthodox priest who said that, I guess he was a prophet of sorts, but he said something about in modern times, it'll be psychological torture. Mm. Uh, and I, I remember reading that and being provoked, like what could he mean by that? And now I'm starting to kind of see what, you know, if there's like this emotional violence that's going on, like there, you mm -hmm. can actually have a disagreement in the, you know, you can't, and like you were saying, disagreement assumes there's something, at least we agree on that there's, there's some sort of truth or, or moral standard or right way of thinking that ought to be sought. And we can kind of, as civil creatures, yeah. unpack and work our way through mm -hmm. that. But if there's not even a shared thing that we worship, yeah. let's call it truth in this case, right, then there's no mm -hmm. conversation to be had. So who's going to win? Like you said, the most violent, the most emotionally intimidating, the most, you know, and yeah. so it's, but, but so th I think to round it out, what you were saying is that you're happy that endowed women are, are engaging the life of the mind because we've got to be thinking and, yeah. you know, um, engaged. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's worth, it's worth doing that. Um, well, the life of the mind is very important and, you know, our minds are like a sponge. And so don't kid yourself. If you, put your, if you put a sponge in muddy water, it's coming out muddy and dirty. So how do you clean a dirty sponge? You know, well, you put it in clean water and you wring it out and back in clean water, and you wring it out. And the clean water is, is, is the scriptures. It's the teaching of the church. It's, it's good, solid reading. It's the truth. It's good truth and goodness and beauty. And, and we've got to be so careful. Our minds are very precious. And I have actually written on my blog, if you, you know, I can send you a link to it, but several articles on just how, how, how the, the chief battleground really for St. Paul and all of his writings was the mind. The mind. But be not conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewal, the renewal of, your, of mind. your mind. Yeah. Do not be like the pagans. Their minds are darkened, you know, you know, and all that. I could go and just, just quote after quote, where again, the chief battleground isn't the flesh, it's the mind. Yep. That's where um, I live. Yeah. That's where I ponder. That's where I think. Yep. You that's know? correct. That's I, I, inner I, place. I, I, yeah, and, and the greatest commandment says that, to love the Lord God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And yeah. so we want to yeah. kind of give that up. But, you know, for me and for many of the endowed women in our community, there's, a, there's an anxiety there and there's a sort of urgency, not just for the human heart's desire to know the truth. And, and I, I love our endowed groups for that reason, because there's, there's that joy of the discovery of the truth that happens when you're reading Edith Stein or John Paul II or Ratzinger mm -hmm. and whatnot. But, but also we know that the youth are leaving at ra in the church in rapid rates because they don't feel the church is intellectual enough or philosophical yeah. enough or, or is against science, which is, as yeah. you mentioned earlier, is, is ironic because science was born out of the presupposition, the assumption that there was a God who created this world and it was worth studying. And so the monks, I mean, scientific research came out of the monastic movement assuming God's existence, right? Mm -hmm. It was an exercise. So, but, but I don't think many many people know that and certain and, and Catholics, a lot of Catholics included. So, you know, if we definitely want to keep our, 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 the younger generation, we've got to be thinkers, mm -hmm. you know, we've got to. Isn't it kind of um, paradoxical that in this age uh, where we have so stepped back from reality and live up in our heads that the, the physical sciences have actually blossomed <laughs> because what's the principle of the physical sciences that reality is intelligible. Mm -hmm. That, that, that there's a logike because the logos, you know, God created, God the Father created everything through his son, the logos, and that logos, that word imposes a logike or a logic on all the creation. God, God thought reality into being. It's, it's comprehensible, it's intelligible, because it's, it's, it's designed by an intelligent maker, you know, and, uh, uh, you, know, you know, anyway, all those are just ways of saying, you know, to... Uh, uh, you know that we, we we've just got to get back to a respect for our minds and um, just recognizing how critical. That's what makes us different from the animals. Right. Yeah. I was telling. I was. I was mentioning that the other day um, on a, one of our. We were. We've been studying Edith Stein together, and and now and. You know, beavers aren't studying Edith Stein or the feminine genius or anything. You know, there, 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 are, no, there are no debates here. This is a, this is a, a human thing, right? E even angels aren't doing study groups. They know things already, but we have to grapple with it. So, well, you know, can I, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, no, well, no. You don't mind, I'd like to make just this remark about that because I get this all the time, you know, from folks like, well, we're just smart apes or we're just no different than the animals. 
Now, you know, I want to just say, I've got a cat somewhere here in the house. She's around here somewhere. You know, she's a mammal. I'm a mammal. You know, all right. She's got four limbs. So do I, you know, lungs, heart, eyes. Okay. But the similarities stop there. I mean, if, if even the highest primate or the dolphins that are supposed to be so smart, if they're just like we are, we're just a little bit smart. Where are their, uh, where are their libraries? Where are their works, great works of art? Where are their cities? Where, where, uh, where are, you know, where are their universities? Where are their legislatures where they debate justice and pass laws? Where do they, where are their courts where they hold each other accountable? Yeah. You know, where's their progress? They're no different than they were 10,000 years ago. Yeah. Whereas we, yeah. There's a huge difference between the human person. It's just observable. You know something by its fruits. We obviously have a spiritual soul, and an intellect, and a will uh, that's uh, in, in the Imago Dei that animals just don't. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it's so obvious. It's all around us. And if you think, well, I know, man. We're just different than, we're different than the animals. <laughs> really? Again, answer all my questions, please. Where are all their, you know, they're, they're, you, you heard my list. Oh, my so goodness. I'm being a little... But a little grouchy here. <laughs> we're not in very, I mean, uh, life is always um, difficult, I think, in whatever age you're, but certainly they were simpler times and simple, obvious truths that are now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> things were odd, more things obvious, yeah. Things that my not, not at all, not even high school educated grandmother would, you yeah. know, she just, <laughs> just, like, just very obvious things that aren't so obvious to people. That aren't anymore. so obvious. So, um, Monty, you're, you're an intellectual giant. So what what do you like to read for fun or what who you know what do you what do you what do you like to read for fun what do you think that women in the church should be reading or you know do you have favorite uh -huh. yeah. names or you know I'd love to kind of pick while I've what I've got you let's pick your brain <laughs> on this you know what do you, what do you read for fun that we don't know about <laughs> Well, you know, I don't know what I read for fun. I will say that um, I am a, I am a quite a quite a reader. I have I'm looking over at my bookshelf here, but you know, of course, I I'm forever reading the Summa and studying Thomas, but. I think for spiritual reading, I, I, I'm, I'm very Carmel. I love Teresa of Avila, uh, John of the Cross. Father Dubé did a great summary of their work. So, by the way, Ralph Martin has a wonderful book on spirituality, The Fulfillment of All Desire. I love Ralph. That's a favorite of mine. Yeah. yeah. And what was the Dubé book that you mentioned? Well, Thomas Dubé has written several, but the one I liked the most was um, uh, Fire Within. Oh, yeah. I love Fire yeah. Within, too. Yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. That's a classic, too. Um, and he, he, does good. he does well, especially in bringing John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila together there. Uh, he does, yeah. I tried to listen to Fire Within in audio. Didn't work. You have to get the, to get the book. Yeah, you got to sit there and read in small, digestible. Yeah. Uh, mo yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But anyway, I think, you know, as far as, I do like, though, I love a lot of books uh, on, on the intersection between science and faith. Huh. Because so many people, you know, think that they're, they're opposed, and of course that's yeah. bizarre. The, look, the, the Galileo incident is like the one example that's sort of an outlier. But otherwise, I mean, we, we're pretty much, I don't mean to be too boastful, but we're the author of science. I mean, the church. Yeah. I mean, the whole scientific method all comes back. I think Bishop Robert Barron years ago, I think, made a very good point where he said that Islam couldn't do it because because the world was, you know, just... A, a thing that God made that's sort of detestable and other other things worship creation so you couldn't break things open and see how they work it's the Christian faith that says no God and his creation are separate and then we can yeah. begin so it's the, really the Christian the Judeo-Christian understanding of faith that I think has unlocked and been the basis of the whole scientific method so I'm always looking for how you know it's just when you look at oh I love rare earth theory um tell me about it I don't know about it well, rare earth theory is, it's not just one or two things that makes life possible here on this planet, mm -hmm. life as we know it, uh, and a higher life like ourselves. It's like 500 things. You know, that the earth is just on just this kind of an axis, not just this much more. Oh, uh, that yeah. The I, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, I do know. Like the privileged planet. Have you seen yeah. that documentary? Yeah, that's I love part, that. Yeah. Like, like we're exactly the right place as far away from the sun otherwise if we were like 0. 0.0001 closer we burn to a crisp i mean that yeah. is so mm -hmm. fascinating how can yeah. there not be a god when you um yeah. look so at many the things time. and I, I could list them all but you know just for the sake of time but you know it's called rare earth theory or you call it privileged planet there's a lot of good books out there and it just makes you fall to your knees and say this is not an accident what are what is man <laughs> that you are mindful of him yeah. Yeah. oh yeah. my goodness so many things, and the statistical possibilities that there's other planets out there with just the right conditions drops dramatically. Now, I'm not saying there isn't, absolutely, I don't know, but I'm going to say that this idea that there's 
Carl Sagan's in billions and billions. And, you know, uh, I mean, that was good. That wasn't good science. And um, yeah. what makes Earth what it is, like even just one other quick thing to add to it. Most of the planets have a fairly steep ellipse, so they go far out from the sun and they come in closer. We're three degrees away from a perfect circle, our orbit. And uh -huh. you, you figure wow. that one out. Wow. It's astonishing all the things, you know, just that make, like, even just the fact that we have some of the stuff that hurts us, like volcanism, you know, volcanoes and earthquakes, okay. but mm -hmm. having a molten core gives us the Van Allen belts, which are, as a, you know, a magnetic field around the earth that deflects the harmful rays of the sun. Exactly. Take away the Van Allen belts and we all cook, we're dead. Wow. You know? And most planets don't have that. Mars used to have much more of it and then it lost its atmosphere. I mean, all these things help to keep things just as they are, and um, it's astonishing. But anyway, that's what I mean. I love science, and uh, getting back to what I read, so the intersection of science and, um, um, you know, the, the connection. Right now, I'm reading a book by Gerald Verstugen called, um, oh God, here it is right here, uh, In the Beginning. Um, a Catholic scientist explains how God made our Earth, how God made our Earth home. And he's talking a little bit about that rare Earth theory. Oh, cool. I'll uh, have to link to that. But he goes even deeper into the physics of it, you know, for example, the strong magnetic force and the weak magnetic force and the electromagnetic force. And if they were all just a little bit, just a little different, we wouldn't be here. Yeah, that it was, um, you obviously are much more well read and versed and understand it better than I do. But in the, the Privileged Planet DVD, um, it was amazing that these NASA scientists, the more that the more deeply they got into these scientific discoveries and and all the things yeah. that you're talking about, the more their faith was strengthened because it yeah. just can't be for nothing, yeah. you know? So I think that was- Oh yeah, and I've got like Thomas Aquinas, 12's Life Lesson from St. Thomas, you know, by Vost. Anyway, those, you're looking at what am I reading? One other quick idea about science that I think I deeply regret is how science has become hijacked by ideologues. And yeah. uh, so it's probably always been a little bit, but it's really bad today. Yeah, and, but, um, you see that most expressed. The I mean, oh yeah, well, see certainly. In, the, in the pro life movement, certainly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, talk about science deniers. You say, well, what else could this be in the womb but a child? I mean, yeah. oh, who's the science denier now? You know, um, yeah. Yeah. but I would also say, I think science has been hijacked. I have a lot of grave questions about climate change, mainly because of its anti human dimensions. There, there's, there's a sounding this huge alarm. By the way, I've lived through these. I'm almost 60 years old. There was an ozone hole. We're all going to die. Uh, we were told that we had a coming ice age when I was in the 70s. The ice age was coming. By the year 2000, uh, all of Canada would be locked in ice. You know, um, we, we were then, that, that switched over to global warming. But now we had ozone holes. We had all kinds of, you know, just one fear-mongering thing after another. Yeah. And it isn't just in that area. There's a lot of fear mongering. The stock market's going to collapse. The debt's well, going. I mean, all this stuff. I know. find it difficult so much to, because it seems like there's so much ideology everywhere, and you know, mm -hmm. it's really hard to like, at least for me, to parcel through all of that and try yeah. to get to the heart of the issue or the good, you know. Mm -hmm. I, and just back to your article, that was so it was so refreshing about your priestly testimony because it, it felt like, oh my gosh, he's finally talking about like the heart of the issue, at least when it comes to the gospel and all these things, because sorting through all the opinions, all the noise, all the distraction, all the opinions, all the ideology mm -hmm. within mm -hmm. and without from the church, I was like, okay, I'm finally reading something that's human yeah. and real, but on the, on the scientific end of things, yeah, it's real. You don't want to just rule out because somebody might look or be different than you politically or religiously and you want to take serious you want to take everybody seriously um, but it's just so hard to pull out what's true even in the scientific world because the scientific world has now been dominated by ideology so yeah. that's all i wanted to say is that it's challenging yeah. to get to the truth because we're not a culture yeah. that really is dedicated unwaveringly to truth, regardless yeah. of personal conviction uh, yeah. and all of that. So yeah, and I just finally I just to to type the science piece. You know, I just regret how it's been hijacked because ultimately I think what science when even they use the phrase settled science, that's terrible. Science is never settled. It's real science is supposed to have this awesome respect for the evidence. You know, if the evidence goes against my theory, well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm the one that should go, not the not the evidence. Yeah. <laughs> I like the awesome response. But I think ultimately, nobody seems to be able to answer me regarding global warming. Well, what is the ideal temperature of the planet? How much ice should we have or not have at the poles? Yeah. Who, who's to say? 
I don't know. Nobody seems to answer that, but uh, we just hear this c catastrophe. Now, again, by the way, I, I love recycling. Not all of it. I mean, some of it's easier to do than others, but I think I love planting trees. I'm trying to take good care of the environment as I know it. I, I can't stand trash. I, I mean, I, I, I don't want to see mindless pollution or mindless, you know, you know, so I'm, I'm not Mr. Radical. Hey man, just use the planet up yeah, either. Yeah. But, but that's, that's what they say. If you even question one thing, you're a complete, you know, science denier, an idiot, you must, in fact, you're probably dangerous and should be arrested. I mean, yeah. it's where we're headed with this stuff. Yeah. And yeah. this is where I think that's the sadness. We can't even have an honest discussion. Because again, it gets back to what we were saying earlier, you know. Right, right. This, uh, we have to start, um, we have to start becoming uncomfortable and talking to people that disagree with and becoming friends mm -hmm. or staying friends with. I mean, the amount of like unfriending on social media or don't talk to me unless you agree with me, the mm -hmm. amount of that going on yeah. is so, is so depressing for me and, and, um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And painful because it precisely those uncomfortable relationships we've got to stay in dialogue because it's the evil one who wants to separate us and not have us talk to each other and not cultivate those relationships with people that don't think like we do. And so then we never really get to truth and we think that we've got a hold on it instead of let's let's be on this journey towards truth together. And like you said, have an awesome respect for the evidence so that mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. You know, if I'm wrong, I'll step back. If you're wrong, you have to step, you know, but like, we have to love, we have to all love the truth first. And Reality is a stubborn thing, isn't it? I think even, of course, inside the church, you know, how we savage each other now. I used to, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I could walk into a Catholic conference and maybe largely conservative in the sense that we were on board with church teachings. But you know, there might be some Latin mass people, some Novus Ordo people. There might have been people who like popular modern music and more country. And we all got along. We just said, well, I don't like, you know, that's not my thing. But now yeah. it's like, you don't check off all the boxes. You yeah. Know? And this is half, this has infected the church too. And yeah. again, I try to walk in the wide church. I love the new mass. I love the old mass. I do them both. Yeah. I love them for different reasons, but I find um, it increasingly hard. It's increasingly hard. I had a very bad experience. Um, a few months back where I had moved to a new city and I was just, I want, I was new. I didn't know any of the churches and um, I, like you, I, I don't even, I don't like labels. Catholic should be Catholic. And yes, if you like praise and worship or you like traditional, doesn't matter. Catholic's Catholic. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. Um, but I walked into a, a brand new church for mass and on St. Teresa of Avila's feast day. I especially wanted to, I got over my sloth for the day and said, you know, this is a, this is an important day. So I'm going to go to go to mass in the morning. And I, I usually receive on the tongue and, um, church allows both. So just do whichever you want. And there's no judgment towards anybody. It's just right. what I prefer. And I'm also Eastern, right? So I'm also not used to receiving mm -hmm. in the hand anyway, because I'm Eastern, right? I'm Armenian, right? As it oh. is, but I, I go to oh. Armenian and Latin. Yeah. So I walk in a brand new and um, I got yelled at by the priest and he said, take it on the hand. And he yelled at me. And because I have a background in theology and canon law and all this, I said, I, I and I very calmly, it was very, you know, it was grace, very calmly. I said, it's my right. Uh, to mm -hmm. receive on the tongue and um and i just thought how sad because and he gave it to me but gruffy like very yelling and, and i started shaking when i left mass because mm -hmm. yeah. uh, he yelled at me but i thought you know this was the moment of communion not it would so it was just so yeah. ironic that and he thought i was making some sort of political catholic political state by receiving the tongue that was not at all my intention at all. And so he ironically used that moment for politics instead of communion oh. with Jesus. And, yeah. uh, and it was, it was painful. It was painful, but we see it. And well, we see the other side too. Right. Or, you know, so it just, it, it, there are these There's ideas. A lot of grief. There's a lot of grief. There's today. A lot of, yeah. And, um, but I just thought, wow, it's new to town. First time in a church. I'm an Eastern well, anyway, and that was the, it was, but we have to, I feel as Christians, uh, we've got to stop um, having our sides in the church and we have to just be really holy Catholic people. <laughs> yeah, and that gets back, I think, to what you're doing, you know, uh, keep people rooted in the sources, the yeah. really good tested sources, yeah. like, you know, all the great saints and the good solid theology and, um, 
Yeah. No, again, our, our, the beautiful thing about the Catholic Church is we have a 2,000-year intellectual tradition, mm-hmm. and it, much of it has stood the test of time. And there's yeah. trendy stuff that goes on in any place, but to look at that good time-tested stuff, obviously the scriptures and then all the other great you know, science, uh, doctors of the church and so on, that's, that's a place where you can form yeah. the unity that we, we so lack today. So let me brag a little bit because we have an endowed study on the doctors of the church and Mm -hmm. St. Hildegard and Teresa of Avila, there's Stein. We have two study guides on Aquinas. Um, Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's something really special that uh, that our women are exposed to the primary source and then we have a secondary commentary and then questions so that we can start to theology, something like you said, just stuck in the mind, you know, but it is something that transforms ourselves and Mm -hmm. cultivates our unique feminine genius. And we have to have one, we have to start a group for men because the mask, I think the masculine genius is ignored too. So do you agree? Do you feel like there's got to be more? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too. uh, We had in this diocese years ago, a St. Lawrence Society and St. Catherine Society. Mm -hmm. Uh, Father Tom Morrow is one of our older priests now. He's in his eighties, but he found that he wanted the groups to be separate because he says men and women, well, if they're, if they're together, they're, shall we say, the men are sometimes distracted. You know? <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. I'm glad you did. <laughs> but, uh, but he would teach them separately, but then they would have socials and things together and, and they would yeah. have some colloquium together. And then they met and got married. And, you know, so it was meant to be kind of, they were separate, but then they would come together yeah. and the, the way they learned. And I think that's very important uh, to have. Now, I do a lot of adult education myself. I do two Bible studies a week. Now, these days on Zoom. Uh, other times, you know, I also I also teach. I have a whole family catechesis. I'm, yeah. I, I also teach uh, homiletics to the deacon candidates. And so I do a lot of teaching. I love teaching. Um, I feel like I'm pretty good at it. But okay. I will say, <clears throat> maybe getting back to <clears throat> something you said, I'd like to maybe also clarify Sometimes in the Bible, heart and mind are used interchangeably, you know, it's not always clear. In our modern world, we think of the heart as that place of emotions and love and the mind where we think. <clears throat> but um, for the Jewish anthropology, things were kind of shifted down. This is where thought was. The gut was where feelings were. And this was to cool the blood. <laughs> oh, wow. <That> <laughs> I mean, so if you praise somebody for having a big heart in Jewish, in the ancient Jewish language, you say they have a big liver. Oh, or you yeah. remember you heard of that's the bowels right. of mercy the, bowel, the bowels of mercy that's right i remember that yeah right. well you know i was taught about the heart um mm-hmm. through father Giussani, through mm-hmm. the founder of cl so i had yeah. as our culture said you know reduces the heart to just your kind of superficial yeah. emotions uh but the heart in the biblical sense is your reason and your affection yeah you working together but um exactly. but i forgot about the, the cooling up here and the <laughs> Good. I, but, you know, the thing is that the heart, the mind, where is it? It's where I live. It's, it's where I think, where I'm alone with myself and alone with God. It's where I have that kapox dei, that capacity for God, to think of God and to be addressed by God and to hear God. So that's the heart. That's the mind. And we have to have such respect for it. And we just expose it to anything we if we're not careful. Yeah. Guard your heart. Guard your mind, you know? Guard it. Oh, I love good that. nourishment, good food, not junk food, you know? But there's so much, I feel like I say this all the time, there's just so much junk food out there. Yeah. And, and it's so hard to keep away from it. And it's, you have to, you know, it was, it, it's not like we're in this, like, there's no such thing as a neutral culture, but <coughs> you know, like you were saying in the high middle ages, you know, there was, it was, there was, there were good things to absorb. Yeah. Integrated. Um, and, yeah. la- and human nature is still very fallen and broken. And so there you have it yeah. right here. You know, we've got our same old broken human nature, but now the culture is not helpful in cultivating right. virtue and in seeking right. after God. So you have to like go through all the mud to get to the good stuff, and the good stuff's really hard to cultivate. You know, I yeah. can, I can get my I can you know eat my junk food, or I can cook a very good meal for dinner, but that takes time and effort and cultivation. Mm-hmm. And we don't have a culture that wants to cultivate the right. life of the mind. It's just it's extra hard. So yeah. Um, a lot of intellectual Twinkies out there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great phrase, intellectual Twinkies. Well, um, thank you so much, Monsignor, for joining me today. This was such a fun conversation, and uh, thank you for. I told you I'd talk your ear off. You know? Yeah, I love it. I want to. I want to keep talking, but um, then <laughs> then my computer won't let me upload this interview. Though, so I oh, file too big, you know. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to. I want to make thank sure you. that this gets out to our community. But um, also, before I say goodbye. Um, I want to let you know that at Endow for uh, 
for many, many years, it's been the tradition of endowed women to intercede and pray for our priests. During mm. our and so with, with every book, we have a, a priest prayer card. And that's yeah. that we as, as women in the church and as faithful daughters want to be interceding and loving, loving our priests and praying for them. So we're praying for you and so grateful for you and, um, and everything that all the, the shepherding that you've done for us. So thank, thank you. you so much. Father. Bless you for that. Great. What a wonderful gift. Thank you. Thank you.